Hi, this is Paul McCartney on behalf of Rad. If you're drinking, you can't drive my car or any car. And remember, don't drink and drive. It's just not worth it. Public service announcement brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, RAD, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. More variety. You're listening to Para X. To stirring the cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Mary Mead, everybody, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Para X Radio Network. Tonight's opening song, Alchemist Chamber by Midnight Syndicate, is sort of an appropriate song for tonight's topic. My guest is author, teacher, and sorcerer Jason Miller, and alchemy and sorcery do go hand in hand. Now, Jason focuses on the arts of practical results-oriented magic coupled with contemplative spirituality and strategic living and life hacking. He's devoted the last 23 years to study witchcraft and magic in its many forms. In fact, he's traveled to New Orleans to study hoodoo, to Europe to study witchcraft, and moved to Nepal to study tantra. He's the author of Financial Sorcery, The Sorcerer's Secrets, and Protection and Reversal Magic, as well as Advanced 
Planetary Magic Chatbook, and the Strategic Sorcery Blog. He's also the creator of the Strategic Sorcery Training, a one-year boot camp in practical magic, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight. So, Jason, welcome back. It's been too long. It has. Thank you for having me back. I know. I saw I, I saw one of your Facebook videos. You got a couple of gray hairs now. <laughs> uh, more more than a few. The uh, the beard it's it, it's almost fully white now. Uh huh. Well, that's very distinguished in men. Yeah, uh, it's amazing what uh, two toddlers will do to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, I was going to say beards on men are cool. White chin hairs on women not so not so well, not so good. Anyway, um, I think that a correspondence course in strategic sorcery is a brilliant idea. So I'm going to jump in and ask uh, what you explained in the beginning of the course, which was why call it sorcery rather than magic or witchcraft or the like? Well, you know, um, <sighs> it, it, I mean, it is magic, just like witchcraft is is, is magic, uh, at least, you know, the spell work in it is. But... These days, the term magic can mean so much more than than practical results-oriented magic. A lot of people are calling themselves magicians when they're mainly focused on illumination. They're focused on getting closer to God through the Kabbalah or uh, through applied spiritual practices and, and, and so on and so forth. So they're not really doing magic in terms of spells to either affect you know affect change in the world around them or affect the minds of other people they're primarily uh as Dion Fortune would say making changes within their own consciousness which is mm-hmm. all well and good and then on the other hand you have witchcraft where the world is is full of witches who are witches in the religious sense. They worship the old gods and and uh, are trying to reclaim those ways and are, are pagan to one extent or another. And uh, witchcraft for them is a religion. And that's also all well and good and, and fine. I have no arguments uh, with either one of those folks or the terminology. And I think spirituality and, and contemplation is extremely important. Uh, but the reason I chose sorcery is because there's no mistaking what we're talking about. When someone says sorcerer, it implies work that is out there mucking things up. Um, <laughs> you're you're getting your hands dirty. You're mm-hmm. doing real practical results-oriented magic. And it also spans those two worlds, whereas the magician is usually involved in very ceremonial magic, intellectual, uh, based, and, and witches uh, tend to do things that are more folk magic based, more intuitive, more... Uh, lunar oriented, the sorcerer can span both of those worlds and it, it is comfortable in each. And uh, that's important for me because that's sort of how I learned magic uh, simultaneously, both ceremonial and, and folk magic at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a good fit for me. And, uh, you know, then afterwards calling it you know i somebody had noted that i had a very strategic approach to uh sorcery and and it suddenly the name strategic sorcery was born so what do you how do you define strategic sorcery well strategic sorcery referring to sort of my system of teachings um has a few key features uh that differentiated i think a little bit But the main one is the approach that it's not really about just doing a spell and then letting it go, nor is it about just doing a spell and then, okay, go and follow up on, you know, getting a job. So, for instance, you know, bad magic is 
oh, I'm going to do a spell to get a job or get a girlfriend or something like that, but I'm not going to leave the house or, or, or do anything. I'm just going to wait <laughs> for that spell to manifest something. Mm-hmm. So that's really terrible magic. And, and anyone worth their salt warns against that. And they'll say, you know, you have to follow up your magic with, uh, with real world work. You know, you have to go out and look for a job. You have to go out and meet people if, if you want to, uh, you know, find love. Um, strategic sorcery takes it one step further than that and says what you should do is find out what all the steps are to get from A to B. And not only do one large enchantment for the whole thing that you're you're aiming at, but to enchant each step along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I, I've in the course there are different things that we talk about, from finding a job to finding love to affecting political change to whatever it is, mm-hmm. and uh, how to apply that strategic approach to it. And always melding, uh, not just doing magic and then the mundane, but really melding those two together and, and making, letting each inform the other. That makes really good sense. And I think it's important right now to note that this course isn't just open to those involved in the craft and religion doesn't necessarily enter into it. It's all you're asking for is an openness to new ideas, a willingness to encourage the world, I mean, engage the world as it is, and um, also people that are willing to do some homework, yeah? <laughs> well, you know, I, I I don't even care whether they do the homework or not. Oh, now, come on, look. Oh, you know what? It's true because I've done, I've done courses myself and um, – I'll, you know, I'm not so much interested in the piece of paper at the end of it. So I may or may not do the homework, but I will still learn from the course. So I never assume that if if I have a student and they don't turn in homework, I never assume that they're not learning or they're not doing the work. I just assume that they're not really interested in um, what I have to say about their work. (laughs) You know, I think everybody that's listening to you say that right now wishes that you were their teacher all throughout school. Just, <laughs> just saying, you know, it, it's, down. It's true, but um, you know, I, I, and I know, a, you know, a lot of people will will get on people about homework, and certainly, you know, if it was a university course or something like that, I would. But um, you know, in the end, uh, there are some people who take the course and and. They they sock it away, knowledge for a later date, and then hopefully they come back to it. And other people, they do all the homework and turn it all in and, and um, you know, uh, work diligently. So it really depends on uh, the person. But I, I never – I never minded it, you know, whether people do the work, the homework or not, I never assume – anything negative or that they've just ignoring the course. I just assume that, you know, they're not doing the homework right now. Oh. But yeah, it, it is open to anyone and it's open to anyone from any spiritual or religious background. We have, uh, you know, people in it that are Christian and we have people in it that are Satanists and we have people in it that are uh, pagan and, and we p- people in it that are atheists. Mm-hmm. And, um, it is it's one of the few systems of magic that takes into account that you are probably already engaged in other systems of magic. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's actually designed to interface with other things uh fairly readily. Mm-hmm. That's good. It's it's kind of like, you know, the open door. Just come in and learn and you no, no matter what your belief system is, you're going to be better off for having done it. I guess that's I like to think so, yeah. Putting it in a nutshell. Now, I really like in talking about spells and, and stuff a little minute ago, that you offer an optional catalyst right for those taking the course to kind of give it a boost from the get go. And I think that's a very strategic idea. Um because it kind of goes along with what you were saying, and it just it, it gets it out there on a positive note before you even start. 
But for those, <clears throat> sorry, who may not know, um, can you explain what the catalyst right is essentially? Well, the the catalyst right is uh, well, a catalyst is anything that is there to speed up a reaction. Uh, in, in chemistry. So it, the catalyst right is there to sort of empower and uh, bolster you and your progress in the course. And this is done by interfacing ritually uh, with some of the symbols in the course and entering into uh, sort of an astral space that has been set up specifically uh, for people working the strategic sorcery course. And, you know, throughout the course, there, there's really, there's sort of two levels of involvement. There's the general teachings of the course that you can apply to just about any system. And then there are things that are symbols, spirits, and, and words, etc., that are specific to this course that you won't find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And people can either use those or not use those, which is why the Catalyst Rite is optional and not, not mandatory. Right. Um, so there are some people for whom strategic sorcery is their main system of magic and, and it supplies uh, spirits and keywords and things like that. And then there are other people who uh, are have done the course and, and sort of take the strategic sorcery approach and bring it into what they already do. Mm -hmm. Now the course is broken down into lessons from meditation through management, offerings, the subtle body energy, and pretty much everything in between. I mean, you've got all bases covered. Um, and one of the requirements of the course, of course, is to have your book, Sorcerer's Secrets. Now, how is the course essentially different than the book? Well, I made sure um, that the book essentially... I wrote the book to be a field guide to practical magic. And the beginning of the book is sort of very basic training. The, the course takes off where the book ends, really. Um, there, I, have, I went to great lengths to make sure that not a whole lot from the book was repeated in the course. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I just, you know, that would just sort of be, um, you know, crappy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but there are certainly things like, uh, the various breaths in the book and knowledge of the three levels, uh, that are required for the course. So knowledge of the three levels in the course, we take that into seven levels. And, and we start looking at it with sort of a finer eye. Um, and then there are, you know, more advanced systems of offering and um, things like financial magic and protection magic and, and so on and so forth are dealt um, in sort of greater detail uh, than they are in the book. Mm -hmm. Yet in in less words too. I I would say you know books are sort of written to to sit back and read and and you know there's good practical information in them, but there's also a lot of storytelling and background and history and things like that. The course is much more pithy. It it's here's what you do. Here's how it's done. And uh, you know. Here's encapsulated in three to five thousand words, which is roughly the length of the lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything that I really have to say about this. Yeah, I was surprised that that each lesson was as concise as it was. You know, I was kind of expecting pages and pages and pages and pages, and and it was not that. It's very concise and very easy to grasp. Now, one of the things um, is that you believe that other than meditation, there is no single practice that you place a higher value on or more than the making um, ah, 
higher value on more than the making of offerings. And I agree. But, you know, that's something that people may overlook. And it's also, um, they don't realize that it includes developing long-term relationship with the spirits we work with. But I want to delve into the subject just a little bit because um, I think offering is very important. Um, but some people may want to do that, but they don't know how to do that. Um, they don't know how to make the connections with spirit. So can you talk a little bit about offerings? Absolutely. Um, actually, the my next chat book, which, which are these sort of, uh, you know, short form, uh, 10,000 word PDFs that I'm doing some of the, how I did advanced planetary magic. My mm. next chat book is going to be about offerings mm. and it is, it is probably, although I, I always say that meditation is the most important practice, the one that people have gotten back to me on with, oh my God, this changed the whole game for me, or this was a life changer, or, uh, you know, my magic has taken on an entirely new meaning now. The number one thing that people say that about is the practice of offerings, mm -hmm. because A, it is so potent. It is it is just so powerful a way to relate to the world. And B, in most Western mystery traditions, it's lacking. Uh, it's not lacking in Eastern traditions and it's not lacking in African or African-derived traditions. In fact, uh, in 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 both Asia and Africa and, and uh, Afro-Caribbean traditions, it forms the basis of most magic. Mm -hmm. uh, but in ceremonial magic, there's not a lot of offering to spirits. And, and in witchcraft, um, you know, it, it seems to have taken a back seat uh, mm -hmm. until more recent times. So basically the idea is that you are making an offering, hopefully on a daily basis, but if not on a weekly basis or a regular basis, um, to various levels of beings. And I, in the course, I describe different levels of, of quote unquote guests to your offering. Mm -hmm. But the main ones are you're making offerings to, uh, the higher beings that you deal with and then you're making offerings to protectors and uh you know sort of go-to spirits of of your tradition or or that you personally deal with then you're making offerings to spirits of place the place that you live the the spirits of the underworld, the, the horizon and uh, the sky and the seas and, you know, all kinds of nature spirits. You're making offerings to the dead. You're making offerings. Uh, also, then lastly, to spirits that uh, are a little angry at you. <laughs> um, you know, spirits that maybe have a grudge against you, either for some kind of past life offense or more likely for the way that we as human beings live, you know, all the time uh, we can sort of overstep our bounds and, and, you know, dump trash places, pollute places, or, or just, you know, have our developments built in a place that was sacred and uh, is now displacing spirits. Mm -hmm. And much as, you know, in areas where, uh, there's been heavy deforestation. You find deers jumping, deer jumping in through people's kitchen windows and, and wrecking the house because they they have nowhere to go. And, and bears showing up in in residential neighborhoods. You have spirits, um, you know, haunting. They're they're literally displaced. And so by making offerings to these different levels, you are. Uh, you're saying to the universe, you know, to this to this class of beings that has a grudge against me, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, let's have a little peace between me and me. I, I, I you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, so you've got that pacification aspect. 
and then to beings who, you know, maybe don't have a grudge against you, you're building a relationship. And that's how you build a relationship with people too. You know, you, you see somebody and, and you want to get to know them. You do something nice for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the end, it pays off magically. And I've always said, you know, if you were to ask a perfect stranger for $50, they would probably say no. If you were to ask a coworker or somebody who is just an acquaintance for $50, maybe they would say yes, maybe they would say no based on your history together. But if you were to ask your best friend, they would, of course, you know, if they had it to give, they would give you the $50 and ask if you needed any more. And that's because you have a long relationship of give and take, of, of going out to dinner and you picking up the check and then them picking up the check and Christmas gifts and, and things like this. And not just physical gifts, but gifts of time and energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how relationships are built. So if you go outside every morning and you pour a little libation on the ground and you light an incense and, and maybe at night you offer some whiskey and a different type of incense, you build a relationship with your environment so that when you are launching spells out there, the spirits of place uh, are there to sort of be like, you need this? No problem, buddy. I got your back. <laughs> Isn't that nice to, you know, something to fall back on? And and it's not, you know, imagination. It really does happen. And um, I think I always thought it was very important. And I'm glad that you could explain it to people because, I mean, it's like if you if you call on your spirit guide, for example, to help you for something, you don't say thank you. You know, I mean, all right, sure, they'll be back the next time. But probably not as happily, you know. I mean, it, it's just. It's just the way it is. It's kind of give and take and, and as you said, making connections. And a second ago you, ago, you talked about guests. Now, who are the four classes of guests? Okay. So the, the four classes of guests um, really consist of the, um, the highest beings, the, the you know, divinity – um gods goddesses or god if you're monotheistic or uh the great mystery if that's how you you know want to play it uh, but divinity the the highest uh beings and then underneath that the the second classification of guests are your guardians, uh, spirits, spirit allies. So, you know, one can think of it in the Christian tradition, these might be angels and saints in that second category. Or in voodoo, it may be the loa in in that second category, some of the loa. In, in other traditions, it might be, um, you know, guardian spirits um, in that second category. And then in the third category, you have basically all sentient beings anywhere, Um, but primarily, you know, the spirits of place. So the spirits of the place where you live, uh, the the spirits of nature, the spirits of electricity, the spirits of everything that that is around you. Mm-hmm. And also the dead, and uh, you know, if you're doing a really expansive offering, you can include living beings uh, in that as well. And then the th- the fourth category of guests would be uh, those spirits to whom you owe debt or uh, who have some kind of grudge against you. Um, how okay? Because this is probably a question that some people are thinking right now. You might know some people, people, humans, that would carry a grudge into the afterlife. But how would you know if any of the other beings, perhaps, or spirits, perhaps are, like, ready to smack you upside the head? <laughs> well, I mean, you you know, in the Tibetan tradition, you do this regularly as sort of just a matter of course. Uh, uh-huh. 
you would, you know, you're not, you're not waiting for a spirit to get pissed off at you to do it. You will make and you know an offering whenever you do the Ryu Sangcho or or something like that. You uh, you you make offerings to this class of spirits uh, that uh, you know you might have uh, caused problems for. So really, I think that you know everyone should just assume that there are some beings. Now, they may not be beings that have the capacity uh, to, uh, you know, to do you harm, or they may be beings that are willing to overlook it or just ignore it, but um, you still get benefit from making offerings to these beings. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if something really powerful is uh, negatively affecting you and you're a sensitive person, then you might experience uh, the symptoms of attack. I remember, uh, you know, I had a certain commute and at a certain area I would get absolutely just road rage um, mm -hmm. to the point where at one point I, I had almost completely just lost my marbles and was getting out of my car to go and and, you know, literally make the news by beating someone's <laughs> head in after they had oh, run nice. off the road in their truck. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I stopped and, and came to my senses, but I looked around and that's sort of like when I saw them. It's like these sort of angry, pissed off beings that used to live in this area that's now basically where the, the parkway and the New Jersey turnpike cross each other <laughs> oh nice nice and uh you know so there are some areas that are just you know just toxic and, and polluted and we've made them that way um psychically as as much as physically right and so you know you can have experiences like that then there are all kinds of uh experiences of of psychic or magical attack uh, be they uh, bad omens or psychological symptoms like you know paranoia and and, and uh, you know mental disturbance and nervousness or physical symptoms of getting ill or or you know even things breaking in your hand all the time or strange occurrences. So there are all these different symptoms of attack. None of them alone indicate that you're really being psychically attacked, but a constellation of them uh, from different categories is enough to sort of, you know, raise an eyebrow. Right. Um, so keeping these spirits, you know, it's not necessarily that your offering will be taken and gladly, so occasionally you might run into situations where uh, you have to do something beyond simple offerings, but the offerings help an awful lot. Mm -hmm. Plus they create what's called passive magic. Uh -huh. um, things just get taken care of because you're now allied with these beings. Mm. You know, That's never a bad thing. Opportunities open up that you didn't even know to enchant for. Uh -huh. um, so – Really, offerings is – even if you're a complete atheist about it and you just make an offering to the universe itself, it is of such enormous benefit um, that I can't speak highly enough about it. And you also in, – in the lesson plan, you talk about five types of offerings and um, again, because I think that many people maybe would like to make offerings but don't know what or how – um, can you kind of go over that real quick? Yes. Yes, I will. Um, the, I have to remember my own lesson now. It's, <laughs> it's been <laughs> a long time. Got the teacher. All right. Uh, no, no, no. I, I can remember now. Uh, I mean, basically, the five types of offerings are, are the, how kind of gonzo you want to get with it. So I think I listed them as uh, normal being sort of in the middle. And I list that as having one or more physical supports. So, for instance, lighting a stick of incense or pouring some water on the ground, 
uh, acknowledging one or more classes of guests with a small ceremony that maybe only has a few lines. So, you know, if you were to go outside in the morning and, and pour a little water or tea on the ground and offer up some incense and say, you know, like Tibetans would go outside and simply go, Om Shuddha Sung Shuddha Shuddha Swaha, then that would be sort of like normal. Mm-hmm. And then you can either get more elaborate or more concise. So to get more concise, I had said, you know, well, a concise offering would be no physical support at all, just acknowledging the classes of guests with a small ceremony consisting of only a few lines. So in this case, the offering would be energy. You would be rubbing your hands together or in some other way doing a visualized offering or or offering energy um, out to the spirits. And then there's extremely concise where there's no physical support and there's no verbal ceremony other than perhaps a word or something like that. Uh-huh. Um, and that would be, you know, an extremely concise offering. One might do that, you know, if you were, say, out in a public park and you fell asleep against a tree and you decided to make an offering to the dryadic spirits of the park without kind of, you know, letting anyone know that you're doing any kind of magic. You might just put your hand on the tree and and say a word of offering. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you can get elaborate and extremely elaborate. So an elaborate offering would have two or more physical supports, acknowledge all the classes of beings that I've, I've talked about, um, but with a ceremony that, that could still be done in a fairly short time by one person. Mm-hmm. And so this, there might be an offering of different types of food or different types of things that you put into the fire or, um, you know, something beyond just, uh, incense and, and light and, and liquid, mm-hmm. um, and then there's extremely elaborate offerings, and this would be a large ceremony, uh, usually done as a group ceremony. And, and these, you know, would have, you know, bottles and bottles of of of, of stuff, and and uh, you know, lots of food offerings and offerings of music and offerings of of elaborate versions of whatever kind. Mm-hmm. And it's highly ritualized. So these might right. have, you know, an hour of different rituals and chanting and so on and so forth. I love rituals. I really do. Uh, <laughs> I want to skip back up to meditation for just a second because, you know, I've heard so often from people that they can't do it. They don't know how. They can't shut their minds off long enough. And I'm sure you've heard that as well. I mean, what do you tell your students who just look at you and say, I can't meditate? I tell them that they're wrong. <laughs> I tell them that they're wrong. Um, and and the problem is one of expectation. Uh, people sit down and think that the object of meditation is to clear your mind and that they're going to sit down and breathe and suddenly experience clarity and – you know, fullness and everything else. And then like a minute later, they can get up and just be like, ah, that was amazing. You know, the secret of life. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's not what meditation is. Uh, You know, when you sit down to meditate, most people sit down, they focus on the breath or, or whatever the focus is. And then a thought interrupts them. So they sit down and they're like, okay, I breathe in, I breathe out. I am, you know, following the breath, just flowing in and out with it. I wonder how long I've been sitting. Oh, wait, no, I (laughs) flew in and out with the breath. With breath, I hope I'm, am I sitting straight? Or maybe I've slumped a little bit. Oh, no, I shouldn't even be thinking that. Man, I'm always thinking of things instead of meditating. I'm terrible at this. Now I'm worried, you know, now I'm thinking of that instead of meditation. And, you know, when is dinner? And <laughs> um, But the thing is, is that meditation is the act of recognizing this distraction and returning 
to the meditation. So if all you do for 20 minutes is recognize you're distracted, return to the meditation and get distracted again and return to the meditation and just distract it again, you are meditating. Um, it takes a long time for periods of clarity to open up within that. And very often before there's real periods of clarity, there might be clear periods of dullness and boredom uh, that can open up. But you cannot be bad at it because even if you never got to any of those other places, even if all you did for your entire life was watch your mind, recognize when you're distracted, and return to the meditation. You have mastered an amazing skill, and that skill is recognizing when your mind is not acting according to your will mm -hmm. and releasing yourself from that. Now, think about that for a minute. Think about all the times when that would be a really great skill to have. Mm -hmm. You're trying to drop 10 pounds, but you pass the White Castle, and you love White Castle because who doesn't <laughs> love White Castle? And I know you're out in California. You don't have White Castle. so But we know what it is. We're not that yeah. far out. Okay. Right. And they come well, frozen movie, in our store. Harold and Kumar, so everybody knows. <laughs> um, but, you know, so you, you, you pass it, and then you think, you know, oh my God, I really want White Castle. And you pull in. But if you're a meditator, you can recognize this is a distraction from the point of meditation or the point of will. I'm trying to lose 10 pounds. And if you're a meditator, you're used to recognizing that and releasing yourself from it. Mm -hmm. If you're you know, at work and your boss is coming down hard at you and, and your normal response would be to just engage in that hostility and, and fire back, knowing that it's going to come to bite you on the butt later on, you turn around and you disengage because you're a meditator. You're used to recognizing when you're distracted and releasing yourself from that. It's a huge, huge skill. And as a magician – or a witch, or, or any type of person that deals with spirits and, and invocations and, and communication at all, it's an essential skill. Because people always ask, well, how do I know it really is a spirit and not just me, you know, futzing about in my mind? One of the ways is that if you meditate, you get to know how your thoughts arise, how they dissipate, and what they feel like. You will instantly know when something is a communication from something else or if it's your own mind great great explanation um and very important um something else that i i didn't know i learned something from this course hey this is a good thing um you know because if you ask people what the elements are the quick answer will always be fire air water and earth which is common in in most teachings but a lesser her term is, and I may not be pronouncing it right, but Azoth? Az. Okay, and you say it's the fifth element and it's beyond all comprehension. So how do you define it? Well, you know, I, 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 I said it's beyond all comprehension, but I, I shouldn't really say that because, you know, uh, Somebody out there will will argue that you know it's very well that there's nothing beyond comprehension, uh, and maybe that's true. But I have a smart audience; they might, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I view Azoff as the fullness of being, and um, it, it, the term is almost a compromise because in the East they talk about the fifth element as space. Unless you're in the Chinese system, in which case you're you're adding the elements of metal and wood in, so it's a five element system that that's a little bit different. Uh, but but steering clear of the Chinese element system, in Tibetan Buddhism, it's space that is that fifth element. Um, and in the West and in, in more theistic oriented paths, it's spirit that is the fifth element. Mm -hmm. To me, Azoth 
represents both of those to an extent. And uh, it's, it's the fundamental nature of reality uh, that is both reality before manifestation and reality as it is manifested. Mm-hmm. So if you can think of reflections in a mirror, you can think of everything you see in the mirror that is, you know, creating the image as being the four elements that people talk about. Mm-hmm. And then the the quality of reflectiveness itself is the azoth. Mm-hmm. So the mirror, you know, you can shine the mirror at an, at nothing and have it be completely blank and, and essentially uh, let those four elements dissipate and you still have the azoth, the underlying reality. And um, to me, that has both elements of spirit and space to it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and it can be worked with directly. So... Mm-hmm. That's there's a whole lesson in the course dedicated to it. Yeah, I I I did learn. Now here's something that a lot of people will be surprised at. Um, I'm going to lesson eight, prayer, because many people believe that prayer and organized religion are synonymous, and don't think that we pagans are you know well they think that we're way too heathen to pray. And as you say, it's overlooked by many modern magicians, even though prayer itself is a traditional part of magic all over the world and can be a vital tool. So let's talk about prayer and how it relates to strategic sorcery and magic in general. Well, you know, prayer is is, is huge. Prayer is just... Um, it, it exists all over the world i mean even in uh even in buddhist paths where th- there's no ultimate creator god there's a heck of a lot of prayer <laughs> um so really you're hard pressed to find a magical system that doesn't have prayer they might call it invocations and things like that because they're mm-hmm. they're trying to get away from uh you know maybe a bad christian upbringing that that did them ill but ultimately, uh, it it is prayer um, when you're addressing things, uh, be they spirits or or, or uh, gods. Um, you know, you're 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 praying, and it's you know it, it's part and parcel there's a lot of magic that is done purely with prayer a lot of folk magic is done through manipulation of physical objects and then praying over them so there's not a lot of sending energy through the palms or, or drawing things in the air like in ceremonial magic um there's just you know the creation of you know a candle or a mojo or or a petition and then praying over it uh, mm-hmm. to specific powers or or something like that uh, to uh, to activate it. So mm-hmm. you know prayer is really huge and and there's different functions of prayer. Obviously, the prayer for intercession is most pertinent to uh, the path of magic. But there's also prayers of thanksgiving. There's prayers of, um, you know, of of offering. There's prayers of confession and, and, you know, all kinds of functions that that prayer can take for us. So it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. There's also the prayer that is, you know, silence and listening. Um, You know, the, the... contemplative prayer uh, mm-hmm. which is very important well I tell people sometimes that that prayers and spells are kind of synonymous because you know wishing hoping thinking praying for something I mean it's all prayer and again it, it like you said earlier it's just a different name you know invocation or or whatever it is or putting an intention out there I believe that's a prayer of yep. sorts. 
Mm-hmm. It is. It is. And, you know, I mean, the, the reality of it is that if you were to head down to your local Catholic gift store and pick up a copy of, you know, favorite novenas for all occasions, you have what essentially amounts to a spell book. You've got <laughs> different things to pray for, a.k.a., you know, find a job, heal cancer, uh, you know, better sales, whatever it is. And you have a specific saint that is associated with that and then, you know, certain prayers and sometimes certain actions that are associated with it. And, uh, you know, it's all right there. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. good lord, the church around the corner from me even sells, you know, St. Joseph sell your house kits. Oh, jeez. Oh, that was a not a pun, but yeah, wow. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. But yeah, you know, I mean, when I say that to people, they kind of go, huh? no, we don't do spells. You know, well, you know, I, I kind of believe everybody does, but they just, you know, a rose by any other name smells as sweet. Is that the old saying? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it's always what the other people are doing uh, that's magic. Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. Yeah. All as baddie, all as heathens, all as whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're all in the same skin. We're all humans. So then for – anyway. So, so what do you hope that people will take away from this course? Well, you know, what I hope people take away from the course is that, uh, you know, A, practical magic is a good thing uh, mm-hmm. it, it, and it is to be used, not only used in emergencies, as many people believe, not uh, avoided at all costs, not – you know, something to fear because you are messing with the quote-unquote natural order of things or, or uh, anything like that. that. That practical magic is, uh, you know, a benefit of what you do and who you are. And, uh, you know, it is your advantage. So if you are, you know, I, I argue in financial sorcery, I'm like, you know, is it really wrong to do a spell to get promoted? It will probably mean that other people won't get the promotion. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, other people have their natural talents that they rely on as well. Some people are born right. looking like Don Draper. Some people are born in you know the nephew of the boss. Everybody has advantages and disadvantages of this life. So mm-hmm. if your advantage is that you are skilled at practical magic – it mm-hmm. seems ridiculous to go, but I can't use it for it would be unfair. Uh, <laughs> because it's not, you know, it doesn't work like it works in, in the movies. You don't do a spell to influence someone and have them be like, yes, master, <laughs> I will make you the vice president of the company. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if that was the case, then, you know, every every pagan festival would be filled with, you know, sort of, dorky guys with supermodel dates and and you know <laughs> sort of you know witches and, and and women being brought in by hunky men carrying them on palanquins because they would just, you know, be able to control their minds so easily but that's <laughs> not really how how it works it's it's right. it's yet another factor of influence it's yet another uh way to affect probability it's not the end all be all. Mm-hmm. And it's a way to, I think, sorry to interrupt, but it's kind of a way to make yourself, for, for example, if you're looking for a promotion, make yourself look better, not necessarily to kick somebody to the curb. You know, right. it, it, they will notice you and your capabilities, where, whereas you might have been overlooked before because you're a quiet type or whatever. So, yeah, it's not to like kick somebody out and you take the place, but it's to enhance the things that you have and hopefully yeah. somebody will notice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah. hopefully people will, will look at it and say, you know, practical magic is a good thing. Mm-hmm. And I have tools now after taking this course to do it better and more successfully than I did before. Mm-hmm. Tools to 
you know, really get in there and uh, do it well mm-hmm. and how to form a plan, how to enchant multiple ways for the same thing mm-hmm. uh, so that if one of them fails, the other one will won't and, uh, you know, have real practical results. Uh, you know, halfway through the first cycle of the course, people were writing me saying, you know, I've already attained the goal that I set at the beginning. I mean, some people really set strong goals, opening restaurants and, and you know, getting promoted to six-figure jobs or, uh, you know, finding the love of their life or, or you know, um, th- things like that. And also, you know, astral projection and 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 uh finding work as a healer and things like that things that are more spiritual and occult oriented but right. uh you know people have been consistently through the last several years ticking off those goals and then going okay well what's next and voila here's a course and Since time is flying by, this is probably a good time to talk about how and where people can get information about the course, sign up, find out about you, all that good stuff. Well, uh, people can sign up. Uh, You can go to strategicsorcery.net. That is my website. Also in nomenandum.com, but it's easier to to Google. Just put in strategicsorcery.net. <laughs> yes. Um, you can find me on Facebook, uh, just facebook.com slash anomenandum. I'm, I'm there, um, and I'm always posting uh, different free videos and, and uh, you know articles and things like that. I've got my blog. But essentially, Google strategic sorcery, and you will find me. And, and also for – wait, sorry, but for those who – don't even know what Inomenandum is or how to spell it. If you pu- if you're on Facebook and you write in Jason Miller, Inomenandum is in parentheses. Just had to throw that in. There you go. There's just there's two famous Jason Millers. There's mm-hmm. the actor and the MMA fighter. So right. Uh, you know Jason Miller, a cult or something will always get me. But <laughs> um, you know the the other thing I wanted to mention is that a new cycle. Uh, is starting so I'll actually be announcing cycle 14 of the course ah. uh, in a few days and I'll be accepting people into that although you can join the course at any point I just send out back lessons So fantastic well thank you so much for coming on and giving everybody kind of a preview and um, like I said I'm learning stuff from it I'm, I'm even doing my homework so that's kind of a good thing And um, please come back at some future time, and we'll talk some more. Always, Marla. Thank you for having me back, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the course. I certainly will. And um, I want to thank everybody else for being here as well tonight. And since we're kind of hobbling out of here really quick, good night, everybody. (laughs) Blessed be and merry meet again. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Martha Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron staring. Any rebroadcast or use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2013. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. <laughs>